Spirit of God's bringing back the words, <coughs> excuse me, of that course that I mentioned last night. It's not on your course sheet. This particular one isn't. Um, but uh, maybe I could share it with you, and I think we'll be ready to receive the word. We'll save the announcements for the end of the service whatever announcements there need to be made. You gave me a more perfect vision. You gave me a more perfect vision one day. I remember when I used to, I remember when I began to hear that there was something beyond the Feast of Pentecost, something beyond, that there was more. My heart was hungering for more and I, was a bit overwhelmed with it all, but I remember when I started seeing a little bit, and God began to give me a vision. And that's what the Course says. You gave me a more perfect vision one day. You let me see, Lord, what you see. Not what man sees, not what ministries see. Seems like people think God gives them a ministry, and then they need to contact the rest of the world to tell the rest of the world to help them with their ministry. Uh, where did that come in? Where did that come from? It didn't used to be like that. You gave me a more perfect vision one day. You let me see, Lord, what you see. And yet, with that vision, a burden you gave. You remember that? And that burden sanctifies me. It sets me apart. It purges me. It cleanses me. That burden sanctifies me. Don't take my burden. Don't take it away. Don't take it, Lord. Let it stay. Keep me, O oh God, on my face before thee, but don't take my burden away. A lot of people are crying out, Lord, deliver me from this burden, but I believe the heart's cry of God's sons in this hour is don't take my burden away. Let it burden me right down on my face before you, Lord God. And I'll just share that with you. Maybe the Holy Spirit will just minister it to your heart and make it really real to you. Well, we thank the Lord for every good thing that comes from his hand. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights of whom there is no, not even a shadow of turning. And so we Thank him for everything he does with us, through us, for us. For what things seem good and what things seem bad. We know that he worketh all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. In the song our brother sang, mentions the burden as well as the vision and really that's the way it is. The vision God gives becomes the burden of our heart. I read there the first verse of Habakkuk, I think it was. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. <laughs> the burden that he did see didn't say the burden he carried, the burden he saw. Yeah. And so we thank the Lord that he sees fit in bringing us into his yoke, carry that burden with him, which becomes a vision to go where he goes, to do what he does, to say what he says, to think what he thinks. To be what he is. Because we don't think the way God thinks. A very simple way of saying what the prophet said. My thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. Neither are your ways my ways. We don't think the way God thinks. Until we're in his yoke and learn from him. Take my yoke upon you, he said, and learn of me or learn from me, I believe, is uh, literally the way it reads. Not just learn about me, being in my yoke, 
But being in my yoke, you'll learn firsthand from me. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. thought I'd maybe read a verse or two from Prophet Zechariah. The children of Israel had gone back according to the plan and purpose of God after their time of com- captivity. God raised up a man by the name of Cyrus and uh, through him he put in his heart somehow to allow the children of Israel to go back to their land, rebuild the temple. He supported them, sent back some of the vessels that were used in the house of the Lord and so forth. And so time went on, they began to build the temple, but there was a lot of uh, opposition, a lot of discouragement set in. Things were delayed from time to time. And then it says, uh, uh, God uh, uh, sent them two prophets. One, One was Haggai and the other was Zechariah to encourage the builders in the task. So, this vision we talk about is not really our idea at all. If it is, God help us to forget it. It's the vision which, the burden which the prophet Haggai saw, something that God showed him. And uh, if the vision is ours, oh, we can get into all kinds of wonderful works perhaps, and doing many good things, uh, stepping out in faith to do some worthy project that, that uh, we think God wants us to do. We call it stepping out in faith. Uh, I'd like to pause there a little because you're stepping out in faith, you're moving according to the direction of God's Spirit. You're not just saying, well, no, I think I'd like to do this, and I'm going to do it by faith, I'm going to step out and do it. And so much of that goes on, stepping out by faith and doing something. And uh, without going into it in detail, you read particularly Hebrews 11, and you'll find that these men of faith, and we all call it the faith chapter, and the, we call those who were involved the heroes of faith, they moved according to the direction of God. It wasn't just they got tired of what they were doing and let's step out in faith and do something different. It wasn't a case of Abraham saying to Sarah, this is a wicked place, let's get out of this place, let's We don't know where to go, but we'll just step out by faith and go somewhere. They had direction. They had clear direction from the Lord. By vision, by word, by that inward awareness of what God wanted. We're not going to say it has to be by any certain method, but we do must have the assurance that God is doing this. God wants this to be done. He lays that burden upon you. And, um, and so Zechariah and Haggai were the two special prophets God raised up at that time of their discouragement to encourage them to move on with the vision that God had given them and in, for the fulfillment of which he had brought them back to Jerusalem. But opposition sets in and they stopped the building. and So Haggai said, Take courage, go up to the mountain, take wood, build this house, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. goes on to say, You build your own homes. And, and some say, Oh, it's not time to build God's house. Uh, but he says, It's time for you to build your nice homes, and, 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 but not time for God to build his. And God wants a home. You can't hardly conceive of that. The God of the universe, and the more you read about the galaxies out there, the more you would be inclined to think God certainly doesn't need us. I can't imagine God needing us 
that genius over there in Britain, I forget his name, they compare him to Einstein. And they ask him about God. Oh, he says, when I see the, the greatness of the universe, I can't imagine that there could be a God that has any concern for us on a little planet Earth. And David was amazed also at that. But, I mean, he knew there was God, and the heavens declared the glory of God. The firmament showed his handiwork. But he went on to say, but, oh, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Yeah, we stand amazed that God should be mindful of us. But that's, we don't have a proper concept of God unless we see the God who's concerned about the little things as well as the great things. Because everything's so great, God couldn't be concerned about us. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. How they toil not, neither do they spin. Uh, yeah, I say unto you that not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed like one of these lilies. And the birds of the air, they don't sow gardens and, and uh, worry about how they will go. They just trust in the Heavenly Father. Of course, that's a sort of a nice doctrine for those who just want to have the easy life and, you know, and live by faith, you know, without, without working. Until you start to analyze that, and those birds, they keep very busy, and they work hard. From early morning, you hear them chirping out there when you're trying to sleep, and there they are, up our way, we might start to get daylight, what, 3.30, something in the morning, in the longest day. They're up there before we are, and they're still working there when we go to bed, so they work hard. So don't use those scriptures for slothfulness. <laughs> they work hard, but in rest. In total rest. No struggle, no striving. Because God put within them a certain law. A certain law that functions. And they just have to move along in the, under the protection, under the guidance of that law. So we, you almost admire them. You almost think they've got something we haven't got. When we see the simplicity in which they move and the wisdom they have, you know, to, to build their nest and care for their young and protect their young from dangers that exist and all without any wisdom as we know it. For God has put a law within them that functions according to the law of life. But us, we try to live according to the natural law, but we're fallen far lower than the other creatures. And God wouldn't let them be superior to us, so he put a certain curse on them because of man. But God has put within us in redemption a new law, a new law of life called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, which is more powerful, more wonderful, higher than any natural law you see in the world about us or in the animals about us. Law of life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Our problem being that because we don't see the effectual working of that law to the extent we should, we don't. We minimize it. We we don't see the true value of it. We don't appreciate its worth enough to for it to become a vision, a burden that we will not rest until God brings about in His people that which He has designed for His people. Until we come to that place that God has desired us to be walking in harmony with him and total union with his own heart, abiding in his yoke, going where he goes, doing only what he says, thinking his thoughts, walking under that burden of the yoke, which is not burdensome in the sense we think of it. Jesus is my yoke is 
easy and my burden is light. So come, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That law is there. We must continue to seek God till somehow in the outworking of his ways in our lives and the discipline that he would bring upon us, we will have a people who will come into that full functioning of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So led of the spirit motivated by the Spirit, doing only what the Spirit says, not with struggle, but with rest, with confidence that he is leading, because we found ourselves caught away in a new law. You don't stop to, you know, it's very essential that we breathe every, what, second or so. Very essential. We never stop to even think about it, because there's a law there that makes it happen. And so in this natural life, we have those natural laws and we take it for granted. That heart of yours, you know, it, it just keeps thumping away there and pumping hundreds of gallons a day. And we don't even think of it. Don't even give God thanks many times for his goodness to us until perhaps that heart starts to fail in there. Or those lungs start to fail, or some of our faculties start to weaken, and, and we're concerned. And God help us to appreciate the law that is put there by nature, but to pursue that higher law, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's a law that works, but somehow we must. So follow with him and walk with him and by his grace come under that yoke that he was under when he was here. Take my yoke upon you. He was in the yoke of the Heavenly Father. Now he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest into your souls. There's so much unrest amongst God's people dissatisfaction, unrest, just turmoil in many cases. God would have us to come into that rest that pertaineth for the people of God. And it's there for his people. That's why God ordains this temple, that God might have a habitation for himself. But you say, I'm talking, about, I want to know about my rest. Well, we find our rest when God finds his in you and I. God finds his rest in us, then we're at rest. His inheritance in us, that brings us into our inheritance in him. His inheritance is you and I. My inheritance is God. If that's the vision we have, that's God's intention. That's why he told Eliezer and Joshua when they started to divide the land, to give every man his portion in Canaan. Don't give any to the priests. Sounds mean. They were the ones who served in the temple. Don't give them any inheritance, God said. Because I am their inheritance. I am their inheritance. God wants to be our inheritance. How then can I apprehend God? So that's the struggle we go through. And God puts the struggle there. We talked about it. I think we did. I think it is here. <laughs> Maybe it is in private conversation. Yeah, I think it was. Talking to a brother here. Paul talks about entering into his rest. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. And the word there is Understand? Sabbatismos. Sabbatismos. From which we get the word Sabbath. There remains a, a Sabbatismos, a Sabbath. For the people of God, for he that has entered into his rest, God's rest, has ceased from his own works as God did from his. In the next verse, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. It doesn't signify, I don't believe, a feverish 
labor from our way of looking at things. I believe some even translated give diligence. But it does involve a spiritual struggle to enter into this rest. But we must come away from that natural struggle and let it be the burden of the Lord, the struggle of the Lord, the burden of God. And as we take his burden upon us, then we are finding rest even as we pursue the pathway that leads us into it. Is the rest just knowing that we're in God's will, walking with him, doing, doing what he wants us to do? Even in that, there's a rest. Because we learn from him. You say, how could it be said that Jesus' yoke was easy? I wouldn't say it was easy. It was Jesus said my yoke was easy. Because he only did what the Father wanted him to do. He had no vision, no agenda, no formulation of plans how I and my twelve disciples are going to take over this kingdom. No such agenda. Just do the will of God. Oh, the agenda is the God. We're taking over the kingdoms of this world. One man I remember reading or heard on a tape or he was going to go to the White House, not as president, but to be an advisor to the next president. Wow, that was eight, ten years ago. I forget which president it was. But I don't think that he became one of the advisors of the president. And uh, I wouldn't want to advise any president that came. But I do believe that God will have a people. God has a word for them to give to president or ruler or king or monarch of any dictator of any description. God will say, go and tell them this. I believe God will do that. It might not always be the nicest thing to do. It might, he might be putting his head in jeopardy when he does it, but he's got to do it. And there is a kingdom for the saints of God, but it's a kingdom that functions out of our union with him and will be ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. And God told him, rule in the midst of your enemies. You think, I'm ruling and reigning. I'm going to deal with all the evil in the earth. You would, and Jesus will too, but he's been 2,000 years doing it now, and he isn't finished yet. Because God says, rule thou in the midst of your enemy. Oh, if he's ruling, come back here, Lord, and deal with your enemy. He went away to deal with his enemy. Because his enemies are not earthly, they're heavenly. So God, when he raised them from the dead, caused them to ascend far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, that he might have lordship over all created things. No use of being the president of the United States or the, or the president of China, whatever they call him. You could take over that presidency, but what about those principalities and powers up there? Unless you have rulership over them, you won't change anything in this nation or anywhere else. By putting in the right man in the White House or some other country, putting them on the throne, you're not changing anything. If you can change anything God wants you to change by coming into direct contact with the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. We fail to realize that. Try and maneuver things to get things right here. You can go straight to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But that doesn't mean he's going to do it, go the way you want him to go. It's to go into his presence to inquire of him. God, I want, I want you to, oh, I don't know what, eradicate all this evil in the United States. Well, how are you going to do it? Well, use the power of the nation to do it. But with the power of Christ resting upon us, we can do anything he wants us to do. Anything he wants us to do, see? But yeah, but, you know, if we just had this power, we'd go out and we'd dethrone kings and kingdoms and set up righteous government. 
Don't you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, conquered over all things and is now King of kings and Lord of lords and has all things under his feet? But that he rules according to the decree of God to rule in the midst of his enemies until they are subdued. Thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. It goes on to say, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. There's coming a day of power when he's going to fully deal with all the iniquity in the world. In the meantime, God says, rule in the midst of it. According to the purpose of God, he's been ruling and reigning these 2,000 years, doing many, many tremendous things keeping his church alive, allowing it to go down to death's door many times where it seems it's almost extinct in the earth. And God comes on the scene and laughs at his enemies, sends forth his word and brings forth a great moving of God in the land. We need it again, and I think as you hear the voice of God, I think you realize that God is concerned. If you're concerned, God's far more concerned than you are. And if you've got a holy, heaven-sent concern, it's because you're feeling the burden of God's heart. Because God initiates everything that is accomplished in the world through his church. God initiates it to begin with. He always initiates it. And so we read Isaiah 62, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake I will not rest. Isaiah the prophet. I remember reading that one time. I'd read it many times till I almost know it by heart. And I realized, yeah, I know Isaiah saying this, but he's moved along by the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God himself in Isaiah saying, For Zion's sake I will not rest. For Jerusalem's sake I will not hold my peace until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness and the salvation of his own lamp is burning. So it wasn't just Isaiah, God himself saying it. I'm not going to rest until the righteousness of Zion goes forth as brightness and the salvation of others a lamp that burneth. God's not going to rest till that happens. He's preparing a people who will be so filled with his power and fire and light that as they go forth to the nations it will burn and consume the way before them and prepare the hearts of the people for the unveiling of the glory of God until it will be fulfilled that all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We get tired of waiting. Don't you think God gets tired of waiting? But that's part of his nature to wait, to be patient, to be merciful, to be long-suffering. Look at that word, long-suffering. Long-suffering. Suffers long. God suffers long. You see, I can't stand it anymore. Well, you need long-suffering. You need God's long-suffering. Has God been able to endure it? Oh, you say he's God. He can do it. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, he desires to manifest his wrath against the works of evil in the earth? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endures with great long-suffering the vessels of wrath set up for destruction? Paul says, have you ever considered that, that God is enduring with great long-suffering? These vessels of wrath that are being prepared for judgment, God's enduring it. Yeah, if I was, you know, if I had that power, I'd go out and I'd deal with it. I know, that's why God doesn't give you that power. Because he's got a son with all power in heaven and earth. And he's enduring it the same as the Father's enduring it. Enduring it. You could deal with it, can't you, God? Yeah, I know, but... While he's enduring with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath, he's preparing vessels of mercy. God needs vessels of mercy for this old world. 
And while he's enduring the vessels of wrath who are persecuting and harassing the people of God, he's preparing them to be vessels of mercy. Vessels of mercy. Whom he has afore prepared unto glory. So there's two sides of God's patience and long-suffering and allowing God's people to go through trial and tribulation and difficulties of many kinds. Is God is long-suffering and patiently causing you to endure these things? His heart is pain with your pain. He's touched with the feeling of your infirmities because he has the heart of a priest manifested in our Lord Jesus Christ. A priest must have compassion on the ignorant and and those on those who are out of the way because he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Oh, you say, God can't be compassed with it. I know, that's why he became a man, that he could be. That's why he came down into this realm where he could become a man and as a man a priest. That he might be touched with the feeling of the infirmities of his people. That is, his people suffer. God feels it because Jesus feels it. And if Jesus feels it, God feels it. Because they are one. God feels the suffering. Don't you think that God didn't feel? God felt every spike, every nail that he pounded into the hands and the feet of Jesus. God felt it. If the Father was there and the Spirit was there overshadowing that sacrifice that we mentioned last night with the blood of bulls and goats and the Ashes of a heifer. Sprinkling those that are defiled, sanctifies them to, unto the cleanness of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish unto God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Through the eternal spirit, this precious blood was overshadowed, this sacrifice was offered there because of the presence of the eternal spirit. Overshadowing that sacrifice and making it to be acceptable in the sight of God. God's concerned about his people. He, he says he will not rest until the righteousness of Zion goes forth as brightness and the salvation as a lamp that burns. He won't rest till that happens. To make sure he won't rest, he puts that restlessness on the people who will cry unto him, God, we're not going to give you any rest. Well, God said he wouldn't, but he puts that burden on his people. He calls them watchmen. Oh, you say, I thought a watchman was one who goes out and warns the sinner to repent. Yeah, I know he has watchmen to do that too. But I never realized that there was any other kind of watchman. He says, I've set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, who will never hold their peace day or night. You that make mention of the name of the Lord, keep not silence and give God no rest. Can be established until you make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Well, God already said he wasn't going to rest, but then why does he set up watchmen to say, now God, I'm not going to give you rest till this happens. In the wisdom of God, he's always desired to bring men and women into his own holy counsel. Not to counsel him, but to share in his counsel. To partake of his counsel and wisdom. Part of... God's desire, the very fact he made Adam, was to have a man who would represent him in the earth, one with whom he could have fellowship and communion and share his own heart. For he shared his very likeness when he created him. He shared his likeness. We don't quite understand it, but made us in his image and likeness. That we might be the shining forth of his glory. The shining forth of his glory. What God is. God's intention is that men would know who God is and what he's like by looking at his people who are made in his image. 
So we spend our time and energy trying to get the world to believe that there's a God up there in heaven. And that there's a Jesus who died for them and that there's a Jesus who is the light of the world. When God is making that light, he wants that light in his people. He wants Zion to be that light. He wants Zion to shine forth his brightness and the salvation of Zion to be like a burning lamp. God has put all he has into redemption that the fruits of redemption might be such in a people that they will shine forth the glory and the presence of God in the world about us. There'll be no problem preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all nations in a one week's time or in one month's time or however long God, God might see fit. It'll be as easy as can be when God has a people radiating the love and truth and brightness and glory of God in the earth. If we go with our feeble lamps or with lamps that are almost extinguished with lamps sometime that seem to send forth shades of night rather than shades of light. As Milton said in one of his poems, no light but rather darkness visible. No, no light but darkness was visible. And often that's the way it is. And God wants that light to be in his people to be so intense. He says that there be no part dark. No part God. Oh, you say, what do you say? We know these things. I'm just trusting that somehow, whatever days I have left, that God will send forth a word that will be an impartation into the lives of his people. Because the new covenant is impartation. It's not just telling people what God wants. It's an importation of what God wants. It's a ministration. Paul calls it a ministration of life, a ministration of righteousness. It tells also in the epistle to the Hebrews, the new covenant is this, I will write my laws in their hearts and on their minds will I write them. He doesn't say this letter I'm writing is a part of the new covenant. We know it is, it's, but it's the letter. The new covenant is when God writes it on your heart. We thank Him for writing it here, and let's read it much, but as we read it, we desire and seek and pray God will take that word that is written there and write it inside, because that's only the new covenant when it's written inside. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Says the Lord, I will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they will not teach every man his brother and fellow citizens and say, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. And I will remember their sins and their iniquities no more. It's a new covenant. There's many, many people in the church who will not believe the new covenant until God begins to manifest it. You can't believe it because it's written. If it's, we don't see it, we won't believe it. God wants us to see it, that it before we believe it, that it might come into being. That, that which he has declared might come to pass by our believing it. For we're saved by hope. By faith, I know, but hope gives expectation of the thing we're hoping for. Please stop the machine and turn the cassette over. Until God begins to manifest it. You can't believe it because it's written. If it's, we don't see it, we won't believe it. God wants us to see it, that it, before we believe it, that it might come into being. That that which he has declared might come to pass by our believing it. For we're saved by hope. By faith, I know, but hope gives expectation of the thing we're hoping for. Not a vain hope. 
Bible hope is not something inferior to faith, it's greater. Now, about a faith, hope, charity. Because hope goes on from faith to anticipate what God said. Anticipate what he said. It look forward to the fulfillment of it so that the earnest expectation of the creation is waiting for the manifestation, the unveiling of the sons of God. And they shall go forth with the unveiled glory of God upon them. Creation is waiting for that. They don't know it. It's not a vain hope. Bible hope is not something inferior to faith is greater. Now, about a faith, hope, charity. Because hope goes on from faith to anticipate what God said. Anticipate what he said. It look forward to the fulfillment of it so that the earnest expectation of the creation is waiting for the manifestation, the unveiling of the sons of God when they shall go forth with the unveiled glory of God upon them. Creation is waiting for that. They don't know it. They're not consciously aware of it. But in God's heart and mind, he knows that's the need of the world, and that's really what they're waiting for. The day when God's sons will go forth with the unveiled glory of God upon them. Man wrote me, he says, I heard that you no longer believe in the manifestation of the sons of God doctrine. I'd just like to hear it from you directly. And I wrote back, I said, tell, tell me what you mean by it, and then I can tell you whether I can say yes or no. But without waiting for an answer, I said, this is what I believe about the manifestation of God's Son. He's going to have a people in the earth walking in the same meekness and humility and love and patience of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not going to love their lives even unto death. They'll be ready to lay down their lives even as he laid down his life. They will be followers of him. They'll be like him. Not only in the power they manifest, but in the life they live and in the patience and love and truth and righteousness that they display in their lives. And I don't know how all I put it, but the people walking like Jesus walked in this earth. He had no agenda, no plan, no ideas of the kingdom he had to fulfill but to do the will of the Father. And in doing the will of the Father, he perfectly fulfilled all Scripture, perfectly pleased the Father in so much on several occasions the Father spoke from heaven clearly saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He didn't come to earth to be a king in the sense that we know kings. He came to be a bond slave that he would have an ear that was totally open to the voice of the Heavenly Father. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And whole burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, he said, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. That was his agenda. Oh, I know he did many things, and you can read about it in the four Gospels. But it's all summed up in that word. I'm just here to do your will, O oh God. Insomuch that the commitment was so great, so deep, so wonderfully blessed, he came to the place where he said, I can't do anything of myself. The Son of God. I can in my own self do nothing. But what I see the Father doing, I do it. I speak the words that he gives me. I go where he wants me to go. I'm in. A bond slave came to earth to be to learn obedience. People say, oh, or he was a disobedient, so he had to... No, he never was disobedient. But up there, there was no place for obedience to transpire in his life. He was Lord of all. came to earth as a bond slave that he might learn obedience by the things that he suffered. Learn the voice of God. Learn walking in subjection to the Heavenly Father. Coming into a realm where we are. That having dealt with our sins, he might become our example. Until he deals with our sins, no way you and I can follow him or use him as our example. But when he becomes our sin offering and our Savior, and the one who justifies us, 
then he becomes our example. And so we thank the Lord for this beautiful plan of redemption, which he accomplished at the cross, but ever since the cross he's been continuing to work out the glories of his redemption and his people who are still in the earth, walking in the realms of it infirmity and weakness and oftentimes sin and sickness and all sorts of things that pertain to the old life. Continuing to work in them his own good pleasure until in the fullness of God's intention he will have in the earth a race of people after the image of the last Adam just as he has now a race of people after the image of the first Adam. We have another race of people after the image of the firstborn. He being the firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn of a brand new creation. So we thank the Lord for that vision, God's vision. We pray that he will clarify our vision, that we might see what God sees and hear what he hears and hear what he speaks until we come to that place of where we can truly be approved of God as his servants in the earth, approved through fires, tribulations, tests, trials. I should return to the prophet Zechariah. The Lord starts out in chapter 1 by saying, the Lord has been displeased with your fathers. Therefore, say thou unto them. Haggai and Zechariah were there encouraging them to go on with God, to build this temple, to seek God for the way in which they are to conduct themselves in this new temple that is to be built. And therefore, in type and shadow, he's giving encouragement and instruction to you and I. Say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. God comes on, God starts this. You say, well, we've got to turn to God. I know, but God starts it by saying, Zechariah, you go and tell the people to turn to me. So God starts the whole thing. Yeah, we're wavered from him. Thank the Lord for the fact that he is the initiator of all things. We don't initiate anything, but he does want our cooperation. He wants us to respond. He wants us to, he speaks, and he wants us to hear. He speaks twice, and we don't know his voice three times like he did to Samuel. And finally, Eli realized that it had to be the voice of God. He says, you go back, and the next time he speaks, say, speak, Lord, for thy servant here. So God speaks and speaks, and we're dull of hearing. We, we don't hear. He speaks at it. He initiates it. Samuel didn't just rise up because there was corruption in Israel and they needed a new prophet and God, I volunteer. God came on the scene and preceded even Samuel's time. Hannah, his mother. God kept her barren. Because God was going to do something very tremendous, so he kept her barren. God does that. Those his chosen women in the Old Testament very often were barren, helpless, cried out for sons, daughters, just because it was inherent within them, I guess, but God would keep them barren if he had something special in mind. So Sarah was barren. Rebecca was barren. Rachel was barren for a season. And it was a, it was, it was a reproach to them many times. Hannah was barren. And she became a reproach. Uh, but the, she kept crying unto God. God kept her barren to keep her crying unto him. God keeps you and I in a barren condition many, many times. Generally, he'll do it for those who really love him. He'll keep them barren and unfruitful because he loves them. Because he loves them. Because he wants to be glorified in giving, causing the barren to bear seven, as Hannah prayed. Made her fruitful, but she must know the time of desolation and reproach uh, before she's humble enough, meek enough, in the sight of God, 
to be the chosen vessel God wants her to be. Rachel cried out, get, get me children, I'd die. Eventually, God gave her a son. Joseph. Then she said, I should call him Joseph. It means he will add. Minister friend visiting us, he put it very bluntly, he says, she was saying, I want another one. I love this Joseph. Give me another one. Joseph, he will add. God gave her another one. Benjamin. And so you see, rejoice thou barren that bears not. Rejoice, the prophet said, for the children of the desolate shall be more than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. And so it's the day for the barren, it's the day for the poor and the helpless, for those who have nothing, are nothing. It's the day when God's going to come on the scene in his great glory and majesty. And give to those in the church who love him but don't feel they are effectual in the work of the Lord. They don't feel they have anything to really present to God's people. It's their day. Because Paul says God is going to give. He didn't say is going to. He says he has done it. I know he has done it, but time is here when he will do it again. I like those passages. I've glorified your name. I'll do it again. God's going to do it again. And he'll keep doing it again until he has that, that fruit that he has in mind. He'll keep doing it again and again until he has brought forth that which delights his own heart. Not enough that he'd get it in the New Testament church. He had to do it again through church history. And we're always going back in church history to read about the wonderful things he did back there, and that's good. I like reading about that. But keep this in mind. If it's in church history and there's something in the past that we don't have now, God's going to do it again. When he does it again, it's going to be still greater. Because the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. God said. It keeps the best one till the last. He will be glorified in the end times far more than he was in the beginning. He's both. He says, I'm the beginning, I'm the end. Jesus, I'm the end. He's the one who is going to occupy. What's the end time truth all about? It's about the Lord Jesus and his revelation in the end time. End time truth is nothing more than the Lord Jesus Christ coming on the scene in the end time to magnify his great name in the earth. The beginning was wonderful. The end is going to be the consummation. Isn't the harvest better than the time of sowing? We can't have the harvest without the time of sowing, but isn't it better? Isn't that what the husbandman is waiting for? The precious fruit of the earth? Yeah, yeah. We've had long patience for it. Yeah. That received the early and the latter rain. Oh, send the rain, Lord, send the rain. And beautiful course. God must send it because he's the gardener and he's looking for the fruit. He's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. We like the feel of the rain, and that's good. We need that rain. We only need it because God needs fruit in the earth. Fruit from his people. That the nations of the earth were famishing for truth and righteousness might come and partake of his people. So Paul says, you're one body, but you're one brain. Taking of a people of whom the nation might partake of. A people who become that living bread in a famishing world. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. God is saying, I'm jealous over Jerusalem. I'm jealous over my people. Paul said, writing to the Corinthians, I'm jealous over you, Corinthians, with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to, as a chaste virgin unto her husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. 
He says, I've espoused you. I've, I've so ministered Christ among you that you might become a chaste virgin unto Christ. I've heard of the phrase, the husband ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. It's, it's wrong. It's the wrong terminology. Not a husband ministry, it's a servant ministry. And when the, this servant went to find a bride for Isaac, he had to be a trusted servant. It's one of his older servants, one who he trusted. He must have trusted him tremendously. Go down there and pick out a bride for Isaac and bring her back for Isaac. And he was jealous over his master's desire and to make sure that he'd get the right one for his master Isaac. He had a godly jealousy for that. And I believe the true ministry in this last hour that God's going to raise up a true ministry that going to be exceedingly jealous for God's people. Not becoming the husband of the church so that he's got a bride that will do anything he says, but present that bride, chaste, pure, spotless under the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the purpose of ministry. Not to be a husband of ministry, a servant of ministry, a doulos ministry. Eunuchs, as it were, in the house of God. That this virgin might become, come forth pure and holy. Worthy of Jesus. Church doesn't think highly of that. I mean, I'm saved, ain't I? I talk in tongues. I'm ready to go. When Rebecca went there, when Isaac went there to pick out this bride, he prayed earnestly that God would send the right one. And he brought garments for her. He brought gifts for her. Gave her the garments that she would need for the journey home even. And God has bridal garments for his people. There's a cleansing that he must bring upon his people to make us to be that virgin bride that's suitable, that's compatible with the Lord Jesus Christ. Somehow, well, I'm saved, it doesn't matter. It matters as far as God's concerned, it matters as far as Jesus is concerned, that he has a bride that's spotless, pure, holy, undefiled. Oh, I know I'm not. I know we're not that way, but redemption, that's what redemption is all about, to make us that way. To cleanse us of so clean, so pure in the sight of God that God looks down and he says, you've never sinned, you're pure, you're holy. You're clean. I think of this story I read, I, might, I don't know if I told it here, I think I told it to one or two at least. In this meeting some years ago, they were having a, the Spirit was flowing freely and there were many prophets and they were praying over people who had come forward for prayer. And this woman was coming forward and she was broken and weeping and this prophet prayed, Lord, what is it? And the Lord said, she's grieving over her sins that she's committed and confessed. She's grieving over them. So when she came up to him, he says, you've been grieving over sins that you've committed and the Lord has cleansed and washed you. And I asked the Lord what those sins were. And he says, I don't remember. Part of the new covenant. You know what I have to remember things like that. God says, that your sins and your iniquities, I remember no more. <laughs> He's God so he can do that. We're human so we can't help but remember. Oh, the glory of the new covenant. That we are unclean, defiled in his sight by redemptive grace and mercy and by the shedding of his blood. And the application of it to our hearts. God's intention in the full application of the blood of Christ to our hearts and minds but be so clean that we'll be virgin in his sight, never having sinned, new creatures, holy, spotless, without blemish in his sight. Oh, you say, when we get to heaven, no before then. By the washing of water by the earth. By 
the washing of the water by the word. God's going to do that. God give us that holy zeal, that holy jealousy for God's people. Paul had gone to stay up here, lest as the serpent beguiled even his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of this toward Christ. He feared that because he knew it would happen. At least the enemy would make an attempt to beguile God's people. To get them off, going off in another direction. To get them listening to the voice of the deceiver. Very prevalent today, I believe. But God's jealous over his people. And God's going to raise up two ministries that be so jealous over his people. That as surely as servant kept to the covenant with his master and did everything that his master told him to do by way of getting this bride for Isaac, God's servants will do the same. They'll have a holy jealousy to see that individual, that weak one, or that strong one or whatever their faults might be to see them so cleansed and purified of the Lord that he will be able to say to them you're not mine you're not my people you're not my sheep you're his it's not a husband ministry to them it's a servant ministry a doulos ministry to present them wholly unto Christ that's what ministry is for Not to make great the ministry, but that the ministry might decrease. That he might increase. Jealous over Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. He's giving all these words to these people who were discouraged because they couldn't seem to get this temple built. They were working on the building. God was working on the priesthood. Joshua was the name of the priest of this new temple. And Zechariah showed Zechariah in vision this man Joshua, the priest, who, according to the ritual outlined in the book of Exodus, must be clothed upon with holy garments, have a holy mitre upon his head, beautiful white robe, he'd have the breastplate in which was held Urim and Thummim. They'd lost that somehow. It was no longer functioning and we don't read about Urim and Thummim anywhere in this chapter or in the other prophets that are yet to, that has spoken after Samuel. I don't think we read of Urim and Thummim. And it bothered them that they didn't have all the instruments that they had in the first temple. Not realizing that instead of having Urim and Thummim in the pocket of the priest, that somehow gave forth a clear word and clear direction, God was beginning to put that Urim and Thummim in his prophet. So that that Urim and Thummim was there in the heart of Samuel. Not that he knew everything, but he knew everything God wanted him to know about any situation. He was able to give clear direction and clear guidance to the people of God. God's going to restore that Urim and Thummim. I know we've got prophets, some genuine prophets, and I'm not denying that. But I believe we're yet to see such a purification of the prophetic ministry. All ministry, but There's literally a prophetic people in the church. A prophetic people. In other words, the Lord Jesus is so present in their midst that in a sense they're all prophets because the spirit of prophecy is there. And John saw that in the book of Revelation or the angel said to him, but the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
the witness of Jesus. That clear witness of Jesus must yet come into the midst of God's people, which is the spirit of prophecy, which is higher than just having a prophet here and there. You have that order in God's people, where they're so in tune with God and so illuminated with his light, that that witness, that testimony of Jesus is there in the congregation, which is the spirit of prophecy. And so Joshua would have had all these beautiful garments on him as he prepared himself to minister in the temple, but that's not the way Zechariah saw him. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing in his right hand to resist him. Perhaps Joshua didn't know, but he'd feel those accusations. I don't feel worthy to be God's priest. I feel unclean. I don't I don't feel clean enough to minister in God's house. No doubt he had many of those accusations that we have from time to time, not realizing that he was feeling that because Satan was standing there to accuse him. So he's called the accuser of the brethren. And uh, the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? The Lord rebuke you. This is a brand plucked out of the fire. I know. Should have been burnt. He was just a burning brand. I plucked him out. The Lord rebuke you. We have a high priest on the throne. And he's plucked us out. He's justified us. And if God justified us by giving his son, Paul says, shall he not with him Freely give us all things, everything we need. He gave the Son to die for us. That was the big, uh, that was the great thing that he did. The lesser thing is to give us everything else we need to bring us into God's intention. That was simple. I mean, the hard thing was to, for Jesus to go to the cross and die. But God did that. Will he not with him freely give us all things? Everything, everything else is simple. That was the hard part. We think it's very hard for God to bring forth the beauty of the Lord and his people. Leave me out. I know, because we feel like Joshua. We hear those words of condemnation rather than those words that follow upon our justification. God has raised us up with him, made us to sit with him in high places in Christ Jesus. God has raised us up prepared as creators, ordained us that we should be to the praise of his glory, we who first trusted in Christ. You're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. God wants to hear those words. Satan brings in the accusations. We know all about that. Any of you who have gone on with the Lord and struggled to come into a higher place in God, you you hear these words of condemnation. Others who don't care, well, I'm saved, I believe in the Lord. Perhaps they don't go through that. But those who truly desire to go with God all the way, they'll feel those condemning thoughts, those accusations that come. Let us see our high priest saying, the Lord rebuke the old Satan. This is a brand looked out of the fire. I know he should have been burned. I'd plucked him out. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. This is new covenant. This is new covenant truth. It's not just, uh, you're unclean. Tear off those filthy garments. I'll help you. Tear them off and i got some new garments for you. Tear off those old garments, Joshua. It's a new covenant. I will write my laws in their heart. I will be his God. They shall be my people. Take away those filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from me, and I will clothe thee with chains of raiment. God says, I will clothe you with change of rain. I know he wants our cooperation. Put on, said Paul, bowels of mercy and kindness and gentleness. Put it on. Take off the old, put on the new. I know 
But it's a new covenant word, and the new covenant word is created. God brings you that place. That new covenant word will come forth you as God, God's people of creative power. God said it way back there in the beginning. After the Spirit of God had moved upon the face of the waters for how many eons we don't know. In the midst of darkness. God said, that would be light. And there was light. I can quote, I could come into this dark room and quote that scripture. Wouldn't happen. Why did it happen? Because of the creative power went along with that word. God intends that this creative living word will go forth in the midst of his people who are assembled under him, where corporately they become the witness of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, and the spirit of prophecy is there. That in that spirit emanating from God's people, whether it be in word or, or in deed, there is a creative life that comes forth to his people. Take away those filthy garments. Clothe them with change of raiment. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. He probably had that mitre that was ordained for the priest on which was written holiness to the Lord. But he was, Zechariah was seeing him as he really was. He didn't have that holy mitre of God. Set a fair mitre upon his head. We have the mind of Christ, Paul says. That's God's gift to us. That's God's working within us. His gift, yes, but it's a working within us as we present ourselves unto him. Then the priest must be the work. Just as when they brought that offering to the priest, they surrendered it to the priest, cooperated with the priest in it all. But then it was in the priest's hand. And he would take all those members and put them together there in the fire on the altar of burnt offering. And so all, our altar of burnt offering is something like that, where God says, present, present yourselves unto him. Present your bodies unto him, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in his sight, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, we transform. We say, I know, I try to do that, but it's because we don't hear that creative voice. I believe that time is coming and one will stand under the anointing of God's Spirit and say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there'll be a living word that will cause to happen what God says. For in the new covenant, what God says, it happens. When God the Creator is speaking it, and He wants us to be in such union with Him that we'll be speaking out from the heart of God, and then it happens. That to be like God said it, and so it happened. And the same God is the God of the new covenant. But Paul says, The God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is on in our hearts. The same God who commanded that light back there is the God who is shone in our hearts. Because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God hasten the day when we will be so committed unto him in the altar burnt offering that we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Knowing what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect will of God. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we cry unto God because God put the cry in the hearts of his people to cry unto him and give him no rest until he makes this happen. So intercession is a great ministry. Some have it as a ministry. God lays that burden there and they can't help but cry unto God, do these things, Lord, that the prophets are saying, do it, Lord. Isn't it enough that they say it? Well, it's all something that God works together in the body of Christ. And that body becomes truly the testimony of Jesus. The spirit of prophecy will be there in their midst to not only declare God's word, but to write that word upon the hearts and minds of his people. 
with a fair miter upon his head, how we need that holy miter. Our minds get so confused, so cluttered up, so divided, thoughts divided, we don't know what many times what the will of the Lord is. That holy miter, I'm sure there will come upon God's people that assurance. This is the way I must go. This is the way I must take. Because that's the witness I have in my heart and in my mind. The confusion will be gone. God's going to take away the confusion of voices and the confusion of thought. And the confusion of all these agendas in the church for fulfilling the purpose of God. And as a people so given over to him that they become the spirit of prophecy in the church. You declare God's intention and see it come to pass as a shining light, as a burning lamp. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, I will keep my charge, and thou shalt also judge my house. Which judge doesn't mean condemn, really. It could bring that. The judgment in the scriptures is minister justice, minister righteousness. You will judge my house with truth and righteousness, and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, that they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. There's a whole new subject there about the branch. The branch that the Lord will raise up out of the sprout of David, our Lord Jesus Christ, but our Lord Jesus Christ who has many branches, yet one vine. And we as members of that vine, as branches in that vine, are vitally one with him. Totally incapable of doing anything except as we are in union with this vine. Beautiful truth. Simple, very simple. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bring forth fruit. Except as abide in the vine, no more can ye abide in me and I in you. So shall ye bring forth much fruit. Goes on to say, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So we grasp that and we're going to work on that because there's so many things we need. Read what precedes it. God help us to abide in you. Bring us so discipline us, Lord, by your spirit. By your truth, by your word, yes, by your guidance upon our lives, we'll come to that place, Lord, that we we hear your voice above every other voice. In the midst of the confusion that abounds, Lord, we, we hear that clear word of the Lord. Samuel, Samuel, give us that grace, Lord. Not just to repeat the words, but from our hearts to say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant here. Bless your people, Lord, here this morning. Open their hearts, minds, souls. Cause them to lay it all down, Lord, all on the altar. Yeah. You might smell that sweet smelling savor of a burnt sacrifice. And that we might have the assurance. I've done that which is pleasing in his sight. Yes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.